good morning. Okay. Morning. Morning. Yes, hello. Okay, we've got people coming in from a lot of different places here this morning. What is it? It's eight o'clock on the dot. All right. Let's see. Good morning from Virginia Beach. Yes. <laughs> hello. Okay, well, we may as well get going. Others will join us, certainly, and then the recording is here, and uh, so it will be available for whoever um, wants to watch it. This one, this issue, this uh, topic today is, well, let me start, actually, with the formal. Welcome to the New Possibilities Hour. We'll work for food, the New Possibilities Hour. It is February 24th, 2022, and today we're honored to have Toby Unwin as our special guest. There's Toby. He's uh, zooming in from Florida, and uh, I'll introduce him in a minute. But first, as, as we all know, there's no charge for these uh, programs. They've been going on now for almost two years, and we just ask that uh, people make a donation to a food bank of their choice or of the speaker's choice. And uh, if you're so inclined to please tell us how much it is you've made for a donation so that then we can keep our running total. So Natalie, where are we today? Hi, Jean, thanks very much. Today's new bright, shiny total for food bank donations is $243,450. Wow, we're almost hitting that quarter of a million dollar mark. Yeah, that's exciting to hit. Maybe we'll hit it here uh, this week and Toby Unrun will be the speaker to take us over the top. Uh, why not, right? Yes. Anyway, yes. So um, let me um, say, so Toby's food bank today is a universal food bank. The idea is give to the food bank of your choice. And wherever it is in the world, um, that would be wonderful. I always say here, you know, feed the world while you're feeding your mind. So uh, let's get to feeding our minds and we'll make our donations then um, to whatever food bank it is that is the one that we prefer. And then if you could let Natalie know, that would be great. So moving to our program today, we're talking artificial intelligence, uh, secrets of the, the law, so to speak, and of litigation. And a gentleman here, Toby Unwin, who's truly, in my opinion, a Renaissance man. I've known Toby for a number of years now. He uh, pioneered lawyer win rates. And when I first met him, I said, what is this you're talking about? Wow, this is very interesting. And what it is, is and he's a co-founder of, well, of uh, Premonition Analytics, you can find it on the internet. It's the world's largest litigation database, uh, bigger than the names that you're familiar with. Uh, Toby began his career in recruitment, eventually founding NetSearch, an online headhunter firm. Uh, Toby was inaugurated as the Republic of Austria's honorary consul in Orlando, Austria's youngest consul of all time. He's a diplomat. He's a best-selling author of several books. He has 14 patents and a video series teaching commercial property investment, owning developments throughout Florida. He sits on numerous boards and he's a national rowing champion, gold medalist. He's a pilot. He holds a world airspeed record. He speaks five languages and he studied international commercial law at King's College in London. Like I said, he's uh, pretty much a Renaissance man. Uh, in every sense of the word. So it's truly our honor and our pleasure to have you here, Toby. I really look at the information that uh, Toby's company develops to, that can be used in so many ways, whether we're um, dispute resolutionists or lawyers in practice, uh, big, big corporations or insurance companies, uh, lo the lawyers who are going to try cases, it's, it's fascinating. So let's just get to it. Toby? Okay, thank you for having me. Let's see if I'm sure thank I'm you for being here. All right. Be good. 
Can people see my screen? Yes. All right. Uh, so I'm co-founder of a company called Premonition. And I'd like to say we do something very interesting. We know which lawyers win before which judges, uh, which we like to call a very, very unfair advantage in litigation. And we basically done that by scraping every online court database in the United States and 12 other countries, which has made us the world's largest litigation database. We have more coverage than LexisNexis, Thomson Reuters and Bloomberg combined. Uh, US court data in particular is a real mess. Uh, a lot of you are gonna be familiar with federal pace of data and it kind of feels like you have everything because you can see every state but it's actually just about two percent of data and 97 percent of it is at the state and local level uh, when we first started doing this we had no idea how many local county courts there were until one day it occurred to me to ask siri and uh, she told me there were 3124 counties and I figured there were 3,124 county courts, and that was a revelation, a breakthrough day for us. Um, I've never met anyone that knows how many courts are in America, and we're experts at this, and we still don't know how many courts are in America. It is a real mess. You would be forgiven for thinking that it was a government operation. Uh, there's one particular, one of my favorite courts that we uh, crawl in Georgia, and every morning, the clerk of court very diligently posts the daily docket in word perfect format. You remember this from last century. Many of the people that work for me are, are too young to, to know word perfect. But uh, that's the kind of thing we have to deal with. And in the oh so sleepy world of legal technology, we have had a near Kardashian amount of hype. Uh, we've been on uh, many TV shows, uh, over 300 articles and appearances. So why do we pick lawyers with data rather than use our kind of human intuition? The bottom line here is that humans are actually not very good at this. This is the UK Court of Appeals. It's the battleground of arguably the finest legal minds on earth. Some of these barristers, Queen's Council here, charge over $8,000 an hour. So you would think with that level of uh, expense at risk that the major law firms that hire them would know how good they are. But you would be wrong. This is Mr. Popular. He's been 41 times in three years. He has a 60% win rate. He's not a bad barrister, but he's not the best. This guy here is who has eight straight wins. And the crazy thing is that when Mr. Popular isn't available, the major law firms like to hire these three monkeys down here who have win rates in the 20s. You are actually better off representing yourself because Pro Se gets 52% in this court. Because of this anomaly here, law firm's choice of barristers is actually 37% worse than random. You're much better off just tossing darts in a directory. And uh, general counsel's choice of law firm is 18% worse than random. So over 200 academic studies have shown that algorithms beat human decision-making nearly all the time. Uh, and that's not necessarily picking on us that we're bad. It also doesn't mean that you must go with whatever the computer says all the time, but it helps us get in the right area code so we know that the people that we're choosing from have uh, consistent replicable uh, results. And we can see other things apart from wins. Uh, divorce law is a tricky one. Uh, for us, uh, there are no win rates per se in divorce court. Internally, we joke this is because everybody loses. As we all know, divorce is the wild west of the legal profession. But as Winston Churchill said, when you're going through hell, go quickly. Also been academic studies that have shown that fast results, low case durations are highly correlated to good outcomes. So you have 
lawyers here, these all the Orlando divorce lawyers and how long their cases go for. So you have fast litigators like Donna Hung and Michelle Bernard who take good care of their clients and get the cases done fast. And then you have people like this asshole here who drags all of his cases over a thousand days. I've given this speech hundreds of times all around the world. The Bar Association has never once called me to inquire who this man is. So they really don't care. Um, I hired this person here to do my divorce mistakenly, and it was a real horror show, which led me to found a legal analytics program <laughs> to bring some transparency to this area. Um, if consumers had access to a chart like this, it would save an awful lot of heartache. So are there lawyers that rarely lose before some judges? And the answer, of course, is yes. I've got my first slab of data from Orange County, Florida, and out popped a chap called Alvin Benton, who had won a highly improbable 32 times in a row before Judge Schreiber. Imagine tossing a coin and it landing heads 32 times in a row. That's what Alvin was doing. Uh, Alvin, a very good lawyer. As we see here, there's that old saying that a good lawyer knows the law, but a great lawyer knows the judge. And uh, that is true. See that illustrated here in the Johnson & Johnson Talc cases. So these are two cases here, two appeals, same facts, same law, same day. <laughs> so you essentially have the same case going on in two different courtrooms across the country at the same time. Uh, one in New Jersey, one in Missouri. And one case goes one way and the other case goes the other. But if you knew that one of those judges had a 33% plaintiff win rate, average is 37 nationally, and the other judge had a 60% plaintiff win rate, you could have a pretty good guess as to what the outcome would likely be, which is exactly what this was. What's different? venue and basically the the people in the venue uh, the people are different uh, we like to think of law as being a, a science very black and white and the good guy always wins like on tv but it's it's a people business and it's an insider business and uh, insiders as you'll see later usually win and keep winning this is judge gersten said facts and law have lost too many times This is Judge Ike down in Miami and a very boring table of lawyer performance data in his court for auto negligence cases. He's had 558 of these in three years. Miami is an absolute horror show for uh, auto negligence cases. All of our uh, insurance clients just absolutely hate it. Here's a table of the, a chart of the lawyers that appear in front of him. So if you're going in Judge Ike's court, you want this guy here, whose name <laughs> escapes me, uh, who has a 18 straight wins. And you often see someone in the bottom right corner. So this is someone who is going there often, but usually loses. And if you asked the so-called experts at the courthouse, who should I hire for I? He goes, oh, you need to hire Bob because, you know, he's in front of him all the time, but in front of him all the time and usually loses is not something that the legal industry keeps track of. These are his auto cases. And as you see here, the chap who's here the most usually loses. He has 16 straight losses. You really want this guy here, Mario Alexander Gomez, who has nine straight wins. Now, here's where things get interesting. Aig is a very conservative judge, and he is no fan of auto negligence plaintiffs. And they win, we get a judgment just 5% of the time in his court. And I can show you judges in other jurisdictions where that number is 68%. The judge is hugely deterministic of the outcome. So if you are an auto negligence plaintiff before Judge Ike, you are probably going to lose. 
unless you hire this man here, Trolletain. That's him. He has a 70% win rate before a 5% judge. And if you calculate all of Ike's judgments for auto, a quarter of them have gone to just one man out of 19,000 lawyers in Miami. So if you're up against Troy Latane, you need to settle early, cut him a check early before it gets expensive. You do not want to take that to trial. Let's see this from the lawyer's perspective. This is Jonathan Meisels. He is the second busiest lawyer in Miami. He only does plaintiff foreclosure work for banks. It's the same client, same facts, same law, same court, same judges over and over and over and over and over again. He's had 1,513 cases in three years. He's fast. He gets a judgment 42% of the time. So if justice is truly blind, he should be about 42% for every judge. Let's take a look. Judge Trarick, 48%. That's pretty close. Judge Bloom loves him, 63%. Our friend Judge Ig has a different opinion, 23%. You shouldn't see a 40% spread for the same lawyer with the same clients in the same court, same facts, same law, between the, between the same judges. But you do because 30.7% of the average case is down to the relationship between the judge and the lawyer. That may not be fair, but it is fact. We can see here, these are Jonathan's clients, and we can see how many cases he does and how long they go and what the outcomes are. And I always thought it was very strange that he won 85% of his cases for beneficial, but only 16% for one West. And I had all kinds of crazy theories as to why that might be the case, until one day I had a foreclosure lawyer come in the office. And he said, I'll tell you precisely why that is. The beneficial, beneficial cases are beautiful. You cannot lose them. They have a solid chain of title. They have every document. Their legal department is extremely well run. They're very responsive. The One West, completely the other way. They have a very weak chain of title. They've lost all their documentation. The legal department is run by monkeys. Uh, they don't return phone calls. Um, that's 16% there are basically default judgments. You cannot win those cases. There are people that just flat out didn't respond. And this light bulb went off in my head. It's like, ah, it's nothing to do with him, it's the client. And later we started thinking, you know, what if we bought a basket of companies that are good in litigation and sold a basket of ones that were not? Could we predict future stock market performance? Because eventually, all these foreclosures will wind up on the balance sheet and then get reported to the stock exchange. And we found that actually we could, and we could predict the stock market eight to 24 months out based on this information. And there's other things we can do with this as well, like risk and underwriting. Here's public supermarket. And uh, typical insurance companies are gonna say, well, we've underwritten other supermarkets before, so we know what supermarket risk profiles look like. And of course, Publix is fairly similar. Most of their stuff is slip and fall, commercial premises liability, but they win 79% of them. But they have quite a lot of auto claims and they're usually losing them. So as an insurance company, you might well say, we will take your premises liability, but we're not touching your auto. And you'd save yourself a lot of money by doing that. Similarly, we can see trends in risk, in outcome, in volumes changing throughout the country. And as a reinsurer, that's very useful. As an insurer, you just have to keep writing and you need government regulator permission to start or stop or change your rates. And that can be very problematic where the situation gets bad. 
Uh, but as a reinsurer, when you're picking and choosing rates, if you're going into areas where things are actually getting a lot better than the market believes, insurance companies run off data that's a couple of years old, um, then you can make a lot of money out of that. So getting into some more interesting questions here. Is big law better? So if a big law lawyer goes up against a small one, who is most likely to win? Uh, usually when I'm doing this for a few hundred people, we ask around the room, but uh, as we're on Zoom, I think that could get quite messy. Uh, so I'll just tell you the answer. Uh, big law lawyer has an edge. Uh, they have a 6.98% advantage over a small firm lawyer. As we see here, just because you are big law doesn't mean you're all that good. Uh, these are the 20 largest law firms in Florida, uh, their Miami coverage, and we've redacted a couple of the names here because we didn't want to get sued. Uh, but you see here, many of the largest national companies have win rates in the 30s. Uh, not terribly good. Uh, you have this one here, I'll name them because they're excellent. Quinteros, 93% win rate, very impressive, insurance defense firm. And then you have some that are not here because there are, most of their litigation is in Orlando uh, and Palm Beach or Tampa. But then you have one, I think it was here, and they don't have a bar because their win rate is actually zero. They didn't win any cases at all during this period. Uh, and they are reputed to be the best, typically top legal surgeons in Miami. But the outcome does not meet the uh, reputation. But as any experienced claims manager will tell you, you don't want to hire a lawyer by the firm. You want to hire the lawyer within the firm. This chart shows you exactly why. Busiest law firm in Miami. These two guys always win. This guy always loses. Who you get assigned is basically whoever is sitting on the bench that day and needs the hours. So it's extremely random and you must be very careful to specify which lawyer will be getting your work. And we'll dive more into that in a moment. So, Given we know that a big lawyer, big firm lawyer is, is better, has an edge over a small firm lawyer, if you had to choose the rest of your life, can't change it, I will only ever go with a big firm or a small firm. Money, no object. You just want to win. Who should you choose? Now, everyone sitting at home is probably saying, well, big law, because you just told us it's the best. That is true on an aggregate basis. But 93.3% of wins come from lawyers at small and medium sized firms. It sounds kind of counterintuitive, but 97% of lawyers don't work for big law. Ironically, big law is not big enough. Even if all of the Amrol 350 were to merge, they would still not be able to field a top lawyer in the top 20 lists of a third of judges. For example, Judge Ike here has no big law lawyer in his top 20. And if you can't get someone in the top 20, you may as well not bother because number 20 typically has a win rate around about 60%. So you're getting in the kind of coin toss range if you're below that. So it's very important to be using small and mid-sized firms to pick individual lawyers based on their win rate for your case type of judge rather than just which firm they're with. Which brings us to another interesting question. Are you getting the best from your panel firms? So we have a tool which we've developed, and I'll show you live, which tackles this. So here we have an insurance company's negligence. Actually, sorry, uh, let me step back here. These are negligence lawyers in Texas. So ones at the top always win, like Stephanie here, who has 24 straight wins. Ones at the bottom always lose. And then you have busy guys over here. Uh, this chap has 432 wins. 
where the lawyers are read are where the lawyers are from the insurance company's panel firms. And you don't need to be a rocket scientist, uh, a data scientist to see that their panel firms are sending them people at random. And that's not because the firms are evil or they're trying to pull one over on them, it's that they don't keep track of outcome. Law firms just don't do that. They keep track of billing and hours, how much money you owe them, that is about it. So if you say, send me your best lawyer for Judge Ike, they can't do that because they have no idea who that is. You can't say, send me your best negligence lawyer. They can't do that. They don't know who that is. So you have to have a system like Remission to know that. Of course, no one wants to hire bad lawyers. So we can do that very quickly by just sliding the win rate bar up to 75%. So we only want lawyers with win rate 75% and up. And now, hey presto, everyone is great. We can zoom in a little bit here as well. So David is great, 162 cases, 87% win rate, we like David. Uh, Luis, eight straight wins. Paul, 11 at 91. Elizabeth, 19 cases, 89% win rate. And the other great thing about law is that good lawyers don't typically cost more than a bad lawyer because there's no transparency, no one really knows who's good or not. Um, I kind of uh, slightly misleading you here because this is one of the interesting questions. Do you get what you pay for in law? Uh, if you pay more for a lawyer, do you get a better result? Uh, and the answer actually is yes. If you pay more for a lawyer, you get a slightly better result. If you pay 100% more, you get a 3% better result. So, it's essentially nothing. It doesn't cost you more to have a better lawyer. And there's other things that go along with that as well. Better lawyers are more experienced. This is an important point to remember because it'll all tie up in the end. Uh, the best lawyers tend to specialize. The best lawyers have more volume. So typically before they were hiring lawyers that have an average of four appearances before a case type and judge, and now they're hiring lawyers that had 24. Much, much more experienced people don't cost them any more. Win rate has gone up by nearly 35%. And when we talked about the best lawyers being faster, the average case time is dropping by 110 days. So these people have less opportunity to bill, and of course they don't cost any more in the first place. So everything is better. Economically, it's a free lunch, and typically general counsel claims managers, they like particular law firms, they make friends with the lawyers there. So this is good for them, they don't have to change, but they still get better performance. You see this here and some of the other ones we've done. This was a, a client's panel beforehand. You see very random, 40%, 100, 0, 150, 33, 0, 100. This was who we gave them, all hundreds apart from this guy here, 16 cases, 81% win rate. If they'd gone outside their panel, they could have had this chap who had an amazing 209 wins in a row. Again, here, they were doing extremely well. They had a 70% win rate, but we still got them another 25% and increased the experience of the lawyers. Which is seen here, don't cost any more money. Associates versus partners, very interesting. You know, I'd always thought, well, partners are better because, you know, you see on TV, the partners are better and you think, well, they're partners, so they're more experienced and they're better, so that's why they got promoted. But as I learned more about law as a business, I realized you make partner because you bill more. <laughs> and billing and winning are not the same thing. And typically when I'm speaking with a large audience, we'll go around the room and ask people what they think about this stuff. And it rapidly becomes clear that no one really knows. Um, turns out partners are actually better, but not by much. A partner is 1.4% better than an associate. You're paying an extra 50% for that 1.4% improvement. 
unless that partner is a woman. Women are significantly better lawyers than men by pretty much any way that you want to manage it. Uh, we have a whole separate report on this called Women in Law, uh, which is being downloaded off our website like a Game of Thrones episode. It is easily the uh, most popular report we've ever put out. Uh, right from the get-go, women are discouraged to go into litigation. 52% uh, of law school graduates are women, but only a third of those go into litigation. It's kind of seen as man's work, uh, which is a shame because female associates are 3% better than men. 20% of partners are women, but only 4.88% of those litigate, which is a real shame because female partners are dramatically better than men. A female partner is 12% better than a male associate. They put more time in on a case, but they build less of it. Their hourly rate is less, they're 23% less likely to be sued for legal malpractice, and they're 15% more likely to win before a female judge. So if you got nothing else out of this and you didn't have access to any <laughs> mitigation analytics system, just hiring female partners is a really good idea. And when you take the female partners out of that 1.4% stat, a male partner is only half a percent better than a male associate. So they're statistically identical. This is one of our most popular products. Uh, so it's called Litigation Scan, and it basically gives a very quick overview as to whether a claims manager needs to worry about a particular case. Here it's a green light because they've hired a lawyer with uh, nine recent cases, 83% success rate, and they have a short list of who they can hire if this guy falls under a bus. And all the cool kids right now are starting to work on what we call propensity to file. So when they get the letter in from the insurance company, they know whether it's one of those billboard guys that doesn't know where the courthouse is or the judge's brother-in-law. Um, and obviously, those are the cases that need to be settled uh, early, maybe pay a bit more if necessary. So the bottom line is that just choosing lawyers on win rate gets you results that are 50% better and 50% cheaper than just hiring a big law firm and crossing your fingers. It's a very interesting and scary stat that we found out just last year. I wanted to know where the kind of break-even point was, what group, and I knew it would be a small group, one half of all cases. And it turns out that just 1.3% of lawyers win half of all the cases. So you're looking at a power curve of skill stacked on top of the power curve of case distribution because the better lawyer is doing more of that type of cases. Very scary part of this, if you flip the numbers around, is as a consumer of law, you have a 98.7% chance of hiring a lawyer that usually loses. And you know, this is a, a good chunk of a reason why a lot of people are not happy with lawyers and are upset that they don't get the kind of result that they are looking for. And again, this is just purely a transparency problem. I think that uh, all great change in law will come from transparency. It's uh, starting to catch on. There's a poll of 80 insurance company CEOs uh, after I spoke. And 96% of them said the best way of choosing a lawyer is their win rate, your case type and judge. Just 4% of them thought that I was talking nonsense or, as I like to think, press the wrong button. And uh, happy to take questions. Thank you, Toby. Now, somebody commented uh, in the chat, just as... I know when I've seen you present this uh, live and in person, uh, the question about settlements and uh, how, if at all, settlements are factored into this. I responded that these are not; these do not include settlements, right? These are just court uh, cases. Is that right? 
Um, well, they're court cases, but I, I personally, we don't like to use the word settlement because it means different things. Uh, we say pre-trial outcome and 97% of cases have a pre-trial outcome. But if you look at the disposition on that case, it very rarely says settled. It will say judgment, which is about 37% of the time, or it says dismissed, which is about 63% of the time. Uh, so we count dismissal as a defense win and a judgment as a plaintiff win. Uh, obviously, you can kind of shade that uh, either way. The difference between a 51 percent lawyer and a 49 percent lawyer is, you know, arguable. But we're not really looking to pick those lawyers. We're looking to pick the, the outliers, the Alvin Bentons that have 32 wins in a row. So if, it, if your results uh, don't show it as a judgment, I guess, then it would be a settlement or uh, something like that. Would that be right? A dismissal. It would be just be gone. Yeah, exactly. I and mean, then you have things like transferred, which we just don't count either way. Okay. Yeah. I, are the insurance companies and, and big corporations using this? to help them decide whether or not to settle cases earlier uh, or then later, or to take them through trial, for example. And if they are using it as a tool to decide which cases to settle, then that obviously um, ties in with this audience that who are mostly you know, mediators helping to settle cases. Yeah, I mean, some of them use it, some of them have their own internal versions of this, which tend to be kind of limited because they run off their own data. Uh, some of the larger insurers will just buy slabs of data off us rather than use our tools. Um, and it, it varies. There's still kind of way too much of uh, the kind of uh, gut feel in, in this, but it, it changes, uh, you know, it's, newer claims managers come in, they tend to rewrite systems and we'll often get calls of saying, you know, we have a bunch of uh, panel, I have a bunch of panel counsel here. I didn't hire them. I have no idea how good any of them are and they'll do a kind of clean, clean sweep and they want data to manage that. I think you remember that there was also some uh, aspect of this where for dispositive motions, for example, a motion for summary judgment or a motion to dismiss, something like that, and maybe for any motion, but at least for those motions, that your system could give a lawyer in practice a report of uh, the similar motions that have been presented in front of their particular judge, maybe with or not with their particular opposing counsel, but the chances for success or not, and then words that were used in the successful motions to help them draft their motions? Yeah, uh, this here is a basically a motions analyzer. So you put in your judge and your case type and what side you're on, and it will show you which motions had the highest success rates. Uh, and then we had a, or have a, a system called Just Text, where you can set those parameters and you can upload your uh, your pleading and it will tell you the likely success rate and then it will also it's kind of like a grammar check it'll underline the statutes and, pre and precedents in green or red and it'll tell you which ones you should put in and which ones you should take out great thank you well here we have a question um corey do you want to just go ahead and um unmute yourself sure sorry i'm not in a great area, but hopefully you can hear me. I was just curious, um, I often mediate cases um, with divorcing clients who have to do a year of separation here in Virginia before they can divorce, but they are at some point in the process, they are hiring divorce lawyers. And I'm wondering at what point, or is it already, is your system accessible? And is the idea for your system to become accessible to general public when they ask for recommended lawyers or when they're trying to assess who to hire in the area? Is this kind of data accessible to them? Um, it is if you live in California. Uh, so we have- Okay, uh, that's my question. Yeah, yeah, we're starting a consumer offering. Uh, it's called lawyersbywinrate.com. So people go in, they go through a form which kind of triages them and scores them. 
and then we'll match them to the best available lawyer by win rate. Uh, so we're starting that off in California, and then as we get better at the matching process, which is a kind of slow bit right now, we will expand out across the rest of the country. Great. What is the timeline on that? Just out of curiosity, if you were to project. Ooh, um, I think we'd be somewhat like Virginia in about a year. I mean, we have the, uh, the data there. It's just the cash flow. You can't really do everything at once because it's too expensive. So you have to start in an area, get it going, widen out. And that, that's the limiting factor. Got it. Thank you. This is wonderful. Uh, wonderful data. Very impressive. Thanks for presenting. Thank you. Yeah. I and mean, it was kind of scratching my own itch for me that, you know, I did not like the lack of transparency in, in law and uh, felt it needed to be fixed. Where are your computers housed and what does that computer room look like that's constantly, you know, following all these court cases? Um, I don't know because <laughs> And if there's a room I've never set foot in it, we, we use, um, most companies nowadays use uh, cloud computing. So we're on uh, AWS, Amazon Web Services. So we just hire, we rent kind of time, it's called an instance on a bunch of different computers. And if we're doing something that's very um, intensive, like when we were first adding on, then you rent a whole bunch of them. Uh, and then as time goes on, you need less of that. Uh, so you kind of scale it, uh, scale it back out. And these computers just crawl um, all these different courts' websites. Is that it for new filings and things? Or yeah, filings? And exactly. So they go and they see what's new and get that, normalize it, download it, put it in one place. Um, and it's it's challenging because even though this is public record, the court, a lot of the court court clerks uh, kind of regard it as belonging to them personally and they're not keen at all on letting you have this data. Uh, for example, in Orange County here, I went years and years ago to the clerk of court and I said, can I have a copy of the court data? And she said, no, so, uh, it's public record. You're a public servant. So let me ask you again, can I have it? And she said, no. And I was pretty annoyed about this. When I saw the website out of the corner of my eyes. I, I do know about web scraping, so I'm just, going to scrape their website. So that's what I did. And then, of course, now if you look at the Orange County site, it's just littered with captures and you have to go for about five of them to get a court case. But you know, that doesn't bother a robot. It bothers humans. Uh, and uh, one of the clerks, of course, said to me years later, said, oh, I see you don't scrape our site anymore. I was like, uh, yeah, we do. Just they can't see it because it looks like uh, Residential IP address, we have 19 million of those. We try to change them every four seconds. Um, it, it just looks like a normal use case. We don't crawl in numerical order, things like that. So it's it's hard to stop. And these things become kind of barriers of entry. So they make it more difficult for our competitors to crawl. But, you know, we're, we're 16 different ways of telling if someone's a bot. And if you know what those 16 are, then you they really can't stop you from doing that. Thank you. Well, it's so fascinating. Does anybody have any, anybody else have any questions or comments? No, there's so many ways this information can be used. Great. Corey still has her hand up, or maybe that's from. <laughs> I just have a question. What other kinds of pushback? I'm so curious. What other kinds of pushback have you gotten for collecting this kind of data, which I'm sure certain companies or groups are not keen on you having? Oh, yeah. I mean, you have to have a, a fairly. Um, thick skin for this. Uh, there's a very interesting personality test, uh, understandmyself.com. This is 10 minutes, $10, changed my life forever. Uh, they tell you where you fit in in the population on the psychometric scales. And uh, turned out I was in the 98th percentile of assertiveness and the 0th percentile of conformity. Uh, but yeah, I mean, there's a lot of people that really, really, really hate this. Um, a lot of lawyers hate this. Um, a lot of you know, people work in the insurance industry who's uh, general counsel, whose job it is to pick your stuff. But, you know, it's very split. There's a lot of people that see it as threatening. There's other people that see, oh, this is like a tool. It means I can do my job better and faster with, you know, um, more CYA. 
Uh, so you, know, you you get a lot of that, and also you know just whenever you were doing something new, there's always people that like it better the old way. Um, so uh, our UK director has been in a ongoing feud for years with the traditional directories because they will use methodology like uh, I'll say things like he's good on his feet and has just the right amount of gray hair well of course these kind of things are nonsense when you compare them to numbers <laughs> and um, you know i think law directories used to be regarded as useful and somewhat gospel truth and nowadays is seen as you know what they actually are which is really advertising so yeah there's uh, a lot of people that don't like what we do any plans, um, Toby, to uh, add in neutrals uh, to your uh, scoring directory? So to add in what? To add in neutrals, mediators or arbitrators, well, you wouldn't really know arbitrators, but mediators perhaps? Uh, uh, we get asked some of this. I mean, the, some, the data tends to be very kind of spread out and some people report it and some people don't. Uh, when we have people that are uh, typically people in, picking uh, mediators and arbitrators by saying, oh, um, they ask their lawyer and their lawyer has an opinion or they'll read their bio and it says, you know, and so-and-so is an avid golfer and, you know, these kind of things are somewhat irrelevant. Uh, so we kind of tend to pick them based on what their track record was as a judge or lawyer. You know, did they lean plaintiff or defendant? It's rare that people are kind of straight down the middle that tend to come from one side or, or another. So we... We tend to pick based on that. We have done uh, judge selection for special interest groups. Uh, and that was quite interesting because we were given a list of people that we were told were, you know, just absolutely tippy top picks. And they were like, they'd been picked at random. <laughs> and, uh, you know, one of them was a family law lawyer. So that has nothing to do with the insurance industry. Um, and then you know, one guy was insurance defense lawyer probably would be a good lawyer for the insurance industry were he to be a judge. Uh, and then uh, there's one guy who was a judge in another circuit and had just like something like a 90 odd percent uh, win rate in favor of the insurance companies and like kind of sent it back with love heart emojis over it as this is the guy you want here. Um, but you know, once you've got the data, it's, it's very easy to, to pick it out. So yes, we do bits of that, but it, it could certainly be better. Thank you. Anybody else? Corey, another question? <laughs> no. Okay. All right. Well, let me just say thank you so much. This is fascinating. It's interesting to know what's going on behind the scenes. And, you know, the legal world is changing and it's not what it used to be. That's for sure. Um, so thank you so much, to Toby. We really appreciate it. And thank you everybody for being here. We'll see you next Thursday. 8 a.m. Pacific time uh, for another fascinating presentation. Take care. Have a good day.